Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show, Your Decision 2018. With me today are the two nominees for Colorado State Treasurer, businessman Brian Watson. Brian, thanks for being here. Glad to be back on your show. All right. Well, it's great having somebody with your business background on the show. I appreciate your being here. And from the State Assembly, the General Assembly, Dave Young, of course, who's been multiple years a member of the Joint Budget Committee as well responsible day for making sure we always have a balanced budget every year. Exactly. It's good to be back here. Thanks hey, it's for great having, having you guys on you the bet. show. Dave, I'm going to start off. Dave, I'll start off with you. Why do you want to be Colorado State Treasurer? Well, you know, there's some fundamental things that the Treasurer does, and I think I have the skill set after uh, the years that I've spent on Joint Budget Committee to actually uh, do the work in the Treasurer's office effectively. Uh, you know, you want your money safely invested, you want it wisely invested, you want it transparently invested. And uh, the work that I've done on the Joint Budget Committee, I think, proves I have a track record of actually being able to do that work. Uh, certainly have great interest in uh, working on the Unclaimed Property Trust Fund. We've done some work on Joint Budget Committee with that. Uh, certainly we've done work in the legislature on PARA. Treasurer sits on the PARA board as a voting member. And so I think there's a number of things that uh, come with my skill set and my track record that actually show that I have the skills to be able to do it. And I'm excited about it. I think there's great promise to, as a problem solver, to be able to do a good job in that office. All right. And we'll talk about some of the problems that the office faces as sure. well. Okay. And Brian, you know, one of the things, of course, you bring a, a business background to, uh, to, you know, to the office potentially. Talk a little bit about that. And, and, and what is your real interest in the office? Yeah. Well, it's because this job matters. Uh, it's a very important office, specifically where we are in the state right now. You know, I grew up from very humble means on the western slope of Colorado, a little town of Olathe. And so that idea of stewardship and grit are really deep within me. And um, went ahead and created my company about 18 years ago. And every day in my company, I am looking for good investment opportunities and being a steward of investment funds. And we need to bring that outsider approach into the government to address some of these issues head on. Uh, things like para. This isn't, we don't need another career politician going in looking for the next job. We need someone who's going to go in there, make a difference, and use all that business experience to truly benefit the people of Colorado. So when you look at, one of the things I'd be really interested in, you know, the current treasurer, there's been some controversy about, you know, his tenure. He's been there for two terms. Uh, what do you think Walker Stapleton has done really well Brian in the office for starters? Well, I think he's done a very good job of bringing para to the forefront of the conversation. You know, this is a can that's being kicked down the road by our state legislature, being inactive on it and truly addressing the problem for many, many years. We're talking about our state's largest single debt obligation, the debt obligation that literally our entire credit rating could be downgraded, which could make a whole lot of things a lot more expensive for us. So Walker's been going in there and aggressively trying to bring para to the forefront of the conversation. Most people, as I I go around the state now have heard of para they know what it means and now we need someone to go in and actually get it addressed so in terms of the public employees retirement association in terms of para i think what a lot of uh, voters don't realize a lot of citizens don't realize is the one of the points you made which is if para runs into uh, continued fiscal problems and gets downgraded it affects the state's bond ratings potentially and so when other agencies whether it be the colorado department of transportation or any agency goes to borrow money they may have to that agency with those bonds may have to be issued at a higher interest rate which costs taxpayers uh, ultimately. Exactly. It's the same thing if you're going for a mortgage to get a home. If you have a lower credit rating, you're going to potentially pay more in interest because you're considered a higher risk. And the state of Colorado, again, this is the largest single unfunded liability in the state by far. We're spending over $230 million a year in interest just to support it. This past year was the first year in Colorado history that we took money from the general fund, $225 million dollars and applied it to para. Senate Bill 200 now anticipates that that's going to be an ongoing thing. Now there's some ambiguity about that, but where could that money go? I've got a good idea. Why don't we keep it in the people's pocket so they can afford their rent and their mortgages and to send their kids to school? That would be a good place to start. 
So, Dave, I really like your take on uh, on you know not just this issue, but the sure. le the legislation to, that just passed. Of course, mm -hmm. several years ago, there was a fix that was passed by the General Assembly for Para. At the time, it was touted as you know this is a permanent solution and all's going to be well. Uh, but obviously, you know, several years later, things actually got worse. Uh, and then we had this legislative fix. The governor signed that bill. Talk a little bit about uh, that bill, the impact it has, and, and your take on what it means going forward. Well, I always like to back up a little bit and talk about the big picture of PARA, because I think sometimes we forget that PARA has been around longer than Social Security. And in fact, it's a replacement for Social Security. People who are on PARA don't actually have access to their full benefits under Social Security, very, very reduced, if any at all. So it's important that we maintain a viable and sustainable uh, PARA in the long haul. So it's been around since 1931, managed really, really well. And then around the year 2000, some really poor decisions were made. And at that point, PARA was slightly overfunded at about 105%. And we could see the downward slide in this uh, funding problem that we have based on those bad decisions. And what, so, were, what were some of those bad decisions? Well, there was a decision, uh, and I think the underlying decision was that, um, that the administration wanted to see people uh, down, they wanted to downsize state government. And uh, instead of actually going in in a proactive way and deciding who should be eliminated from employment, uh, or encouraged to seek employment somewhere else, there was a, an incentive provided to people to just early out by buying service credit at fire sale prices that really weren't paying for the real costs of the benefits that they were going to receive. All so, right, so what, what you're talking about is what PARA did, and this was, I think, under Bill Owens' administration. This was the, the Bill Owens administration, and uh, we had a treasurer at that point that uh, should have stood up and said, wait a minute, the equation doesn't work out here. So the equation is simple. Uh, the interior part of the equation is complicated, as we all know. But if the amount of money that is coming into PARA is greater than or equal to the amount of benefit being paid out, you have a sustainable uh, plan going forward. If the amount of money being paid out is more than what's coming in, that's unsustainable. And that's what the decisions in, in that year actually resulted in was more benefit going out. So if you allow people to uh, retire early, that means that their benefits are gonna be paid over a longer period of time. And it turns out that people are actually living longer than was actually anticipated uh, earlier in the actuarial studies. And so we were paying out more in benefits as a result of this decision. We have to get this equation back into balance. Uh, so the, how, do you, how do you get it back into balance well, in that? And uh, I want to kind of remark on your Right, but first question. of all, let, I want to go back to the years, the, the, the service credit. So mm -hmm. what that did, uh, and, and it still actually exists, though at a higher price, and you mm -hmm. mentioned fire sale prices, is what that did was allow people in the Paris system to buy years. So if you had uh, 10 years of actual service and if you had service in, in a different capacity previously, another 10 years, for example, you could buy 10 years at fire sale prices. So on paper, you had 20 years of service and you then qualified for retirement. Mm -hmm. So one of my concerns about this was that you know, it's, I, I, think, I think taxpayers really feel that, hey, if you're in the trenches as a teacher, or as mm. a fire Which person, a right, fire person, a police mm. officer, you deserve a good pension. Uh, I mean, if you couldn't pay me enough to teach, <laughs> to teach my own kid, for example. But to me, it's different if someone's buying those years at a fire sale price in order to get what I think are very generous benefits. So finish that point. And, you know, if Congress would act on this, there's actually bills that are designed at the federal level to say, listen, if you uh, qualify for Social Security benefits and you also have a uh, retirement system and a state system, you can still uh, access your Social Security benefit. And what's happened is Congress has said, no, you can't access those benefits. And it puts a lot of pressure on people to say, well, that was an earned benefit and I can't access it. So where's the fairness there? I think if they eliminated the, what's called the windfall elimination pr uh, provision, Congress acted on that, a lot of that pressure would come off of Paris. So there's, a, there's one possible solution. All I right, think well, you know, a, when we talk a, about- uh, Hold on one second. I wanna take a quick break. We're oh. way over time in this segment. Okay. Give Brian a chance to respond in a minute. We're gonna be right back with Brian and Dave in just a moment. There's more of the Aaron Harbor Show after this. 
I understand para-recipients, we need to, to address their concerns. But we also have a larger audience out there, which is the people of Colorado. And so if I only go in and just serve one term, but actually make a positive difference to change para, that's a life well lived. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos. And tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. Join me and watch The Aaron Harbor Show. 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 I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch The Aaron Harbor Show and keep hope alive. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at HarborTV.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. The Aaron Harbor Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at HarborTV.com. Welcome back to the show. This is part one of our special two-part series with Dave Young and Brian Watson seeking to be your next Colorado State Treasurer. So Dave, I'm sorry to, I had to interrupt uh, for that break, but you know, you gotta feed the kids, so. Absolutely. Uh, fi but please finish that point, and then I, I want will. Brian Quickly, to. you would ask me about the two fixes, and certainly I don't think the, uh, the understanding of how deep the recession was in, in 2008, 2009 was, was well known when the Senate Bill 1 in 2010 was, was um, passed. Uh, I think there was a belief that uh, proper steps had been taken in order to solve this funding problem created back in the 2000s and uh, exacerbated by two recessions. Uh, but, you know, it, clearly that wasn't, it needed time to actually work to see whether or not it was solving the problem. And it became clear in the last uh, session or two that more work needed to be done. So Senate Bill 200 was run this session. Um, I voted no on the bill, but it was procedural more than anything else uh, at that point because I didn't have the financials. I didn't have the uh, actual document that we were voting on at the time we were voting at the 11th hour on the last day of the session. Uh, as was as as Brian referred to the fact that the, there was concern that the state bond rating was going to be actually uh, downgraded and there was conversation about that the silver lining on Senate Bill 200 is the fact that in fact um, the credit rating agencies are holding off on that downgrading to see what happens with Senate Bill 200 so there may be some good elements in there all right, Brian, <laughs> we just covered a lot of ground. Give me some thoughts on all this. Absolutely. Well, let me first say my campaign is about the people. It's not a partisan campaign. When you talk about para, it's about my sister who's a school teacher up in Erie who's working really hard every single day and hoping that there's a retirement for her. And I'm tired of politicians who constantly make it this political football. You know, a big part of para's problem is our state legislature. You know, they set the contribution amount and they also set the benefit amount. Para's but an administrator in between, and it's been a political punching bag, which is unacceptable. Uh, one of the first things I'm going to do when elected treasurer is call every single board member of Para and sit them down, take them out to a cup of coffee individually or lunch, and get to know them as people and figure out how we can collaborate to make a difference, because this stuff matters. I believe my opponent and I have a fundamental difference in how we view the proper role of government. I personally don't believe that government, uh, people, or employees should get themselves special deals that the rest of us in the private sector don't get. And whether that be health care, whether that be special spending programs for themselves or whatever. You know what? Government is for the people and it shouldn't be for the people who are just in government. And so I think there's a big fundamental difference. And so when looking at PARA and some of the solutions we need to address, Senate Bill 200 was a step in the right direction. But it's really sad to me that our state legislature waited to the last half of the last 
of day of session, actually 30 or 40 minutes before the bell rang, to address the single largest debt obligation in the state of Colorado. Now, granted, there was some discussion and everything during session, but this should be front and center. This is something that is the largest single debt obligation of our state that affects every single hardworking Coloradan. And for me, it's a people issue, and we need to address it head on. All right, so one of the things, of course, people, I think a lot of people in the state don't realize is there are almost 600,000 people uh, directly affected by PARA. Either they're retirees, uh, they're about to retire, or they're in the system now uh, and accruing retire, retirement benefits. That's a huge, uh, that's also really a, a huge political force when you think about it. I mean, if you're, if you're uh, a teacher, if you're in a fire department, a police department or whatever, the odds are you're engaged uh, politically, uh, not only because of para, but because of the kind of work that you do, you're highly likely to be a voter, uh, is, is one of the challenges that it's difficult for uh, folks in office uh, at least it's difficult for them politically to really address this head on uh, because of their concern that, oh my gosh, there's this potentially monolithic uh, voting block out there. Brian? Yeah. Well, first, you're right. There's about 600,000 people. And again, our campaign is about fighting on behalf of the school teachers and the firefighters and others who are depending upon that. But it also affects our small communities. You know, I come from a small town, and people who are receiving those type of benefits have a ripple effect in the economy in the small towns as well. And it affects every one of us uh, in Colorado. So that's one of the interesting things about my campaign. You know, I'm always going to make a living from the private sector. One of my campaigns pledges is not to take a salary from the government. I want to do my small part to try to reduce the cost and burden of government because it's gotten out of control. So I will be the only person on that para board who's not going to be depending on para as my opponent is. And so I believe that'll give me an objective view to say, you know what, I understand para recipients, we need to, to address their concerns. But we also have a larger audience out there, which is the people of Colorado. And so if I only go in and just serve one term, but actually make a positive difference to change para, that's a life well lived. And so I'm not going to cater to all of these different people. I'm going to figure out what's best for all of us to make a positive difference. So Dave, I'd like your thoughts on, on those topics, but sure. also the fact that, I mean, uh, do you think it's a conflict of interest that the para board, which consists primarily of people who uh, are entitled to para benefits, sets numbers like, I mean, Brian mentioned that, you know, what the General Assembly does, but the para board sets a rate of return that it anticipates uh, over, it, it, in some cases, three decades. Uh, that rate of return, I think, historically has been proven in the last certainly several years that the board set has been too optimistic. But by being optimistic, it, it looks like para isn't in as bad shape as it actually is. Uh, that number has been, you know, eight and a half percent annual return, eight percent. I think now it's seven and a quarter. Uh, to guarantee somebody's going to get a return on a portfolio of seven and a quarter percent, and to say we're going to guarantee that, or we're going to expect that for 30 years, uh, from my perspective, uh, as someone who used to be registered with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission as an investment advisor. Uh, I don't see that as being realistic or reasonable. Tell me if I'm wrong. Well, you know, and for the average investor, I think you're probably right. Uh, and Para obviously has a greater uh, amount of money to invest, and so they have access to different kinds of investments that average investors might not be able to access. You know that. Uh, as yeah, well. but sometimes it's harder to invest large sums it of is. money it and is. get a high rate of return than smaller sums. One of the unique uh, pieces of uh, Senate Bill 200 is uh, a, a provision that actually allows for some adjustment based on uh, how uh, returns are coming in and how the economy is doing so that the, uh, the benefit, the inflow, the equation that I talked about, and the benefit structure going out stays in balance. But the, don't you think that rate should be set by an independent group of experts and not by the people who benefit? depending on how they set the rate? Well, and again, they're, they're the administrator between the, uh, between the legislature and the taxpayers that are actually trying to make this work. And they have experts that they're bringing in uh, to advise them on, on that sort of information. But don't so you I think, think they, we should eliminate that conflict of interest? Well, uh, th there's some element of having some skin in the game that actually makes them want to be sure 
that this is a sustainable program. So, you know, but, I, I get experts. I, I mean, what you want, what you want, though, isn't what you want a rate of return projected based on the best mm -hmm. data and scientific approach and not based on whether or not someone benefits. Why, why not have an independent entity say this is what the projected rate of return should There's be? certainly some, uh, some evidence that, that that could be examined that way. But I do think that the Para Board is actually doing that kind of analysis and, and considering that as it exists today. Okay. I think in the bigger picture, what we sometimes forget is the fact that um, this is, Para, a retirement system, is part of an overall compensation system and when you want to have a government that actually works you want to actually be able to attract and retain people that are effective at providing the services that uh, that citizens expect uh, government you know, should be uh, delivering and we can go into education and talk about the fact that if you if we don't get this balance right and it's not just retirement it's compensation it's a total package of compensation we don't get it right then we're going to end up with vacancies, which we have now in many parts of rural Colorado, that are causing our systems to really have a lot of stress. I'd like to address a couple of points on that. So if you believe that school teachers are underpaid, and I'm so grateful that we have school teachers out there, people like my sister, if you want to give teachers a pay raise, fix para. Right now, over 22% of their salary is going to para and other unrelated benefits. If we fix para, they're going to have 11% more buying power in their pocket, which means more money to send their kids to school and put groceries on the table. That's how we address some of these issues. When we're talking about numbers with para, it's very concerning to me. First and foremost, we need to understand what the numbers truly are. Part of the problem is our state legislature is solving for a problem they don't really understand the true magnitude of. So if you and I were trying to figure out a business deal or pay for a mortgage, we'd have to really understand the numbers. Well, at Para, we need to really understand what is this unfunded liability. So right now they're applying a seven and a quarter percent return. If you move that down to, let's say, more conservative means, as you were saying, of maybe five percent, five and a half percent, the unfunded liability rockets to over fifty billion dollars. Now we even have a bigger problem that we have to solve for, and a bigger the problem, the more aggressive things you need to do to solve for it. During the down economy in 2008-2009, Para lost 11% of its value. Now I know as a commercial real estate investor I was hit really hard. I'm sure we all were hit hard in the down economy. But in Para terms, 11% doesn't sound like a whole lot. That was over 20 billion dollars like that. So this is not something we can kick the can down the road as our state legislature has been doing. This is something that's going to make disciplined leadership to step up and do the right thing now. All right, we're going to take our last break. We will be back with Dave and Brian in just a moment. There's more of the Aaron Harbour Show after this. But we're going to have to go back and take the big picture look at this and make sure that we have a good effective system that actually allows uh, the state of Colorado to deliver services that we know people in the state of Colorado want. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. The Rexal Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes an individual who through leadership, skill, and dedication is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harbour. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political, and economic commentator and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbour Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron. It is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations. Just make journalism great again. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos. And tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. 
You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at HarborTV.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. Join me and watch The Aaron Harbor Show. Watch The Aaron Harbor Show. Watch The Aaron Harbor Show. Watch the Aaron Harper Show. Watch the Aaron Harper Show. I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harper Show and keep hope alive. The Aaron Harper Show may be viewed 24 7 at no charge from any location in the world at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. This is our final segment in part one of our two part series with Dave Young and Brian Watson, seeking to be your Colorado state treasurer. I mean, one of the things that the incumbent state treasurer has done, certainly, and I think, Brian, you referenced this, you know, Walker Stapleton has really brought a spotlight on, on these issues. And, and I think that's been a benefit to everyone. I know he made a proposal, uh, which I actually thought was fairly reasonable. The Denver Post characterized it as too extreme. Uh, and then what was really interesting is, is Governor Hickenlooper followed that with his own proposal, which, which actually wasn't a lot different. Uh, than uh, Treasurer Stapleton's. And, and one of the themes that I think people uh, are learning about is that right now, para takes out of school districts' budgets, for example, and I know you know this, Dave, uh, almost a quarter uh, of the funding of that district when it comes to, to salaries. So, so school districts are required to put that money in para. They can't give it directly to teachers. And Brian, I know you were indirectly referencing that. Mm -hmm. The current, uh, the, the latest version from the legislature actually increases that uh, and increases taxpayer contributions. And now, uh, and Brian, as you mentioned, we're actually writing checks with taxpayer dollars from the General Assembly, from the General Fund, directly to PARA. And we haven't done that before. Is that something we should continue? Uh, and give me a, a quick answer. And if not, what should we do uh, to, in essence, replace that money now that, that those checks are being written? Dave. Well, you know, this is why I talked about the year 2000, the bad decisions that were made that, at that okay, time. Okay, no, really, I, we only have a couple minutes. I, I know. Need, uh, should, I, we con should we continue well, to do that? we've got to solve a problem. Should we've we continue to, to do that or not? Give me a yes, yes. or no. We need, to, we need to solve a problem here. Okay, we so can't you think continue we should, to make bad decisions you that so way. So you think we should continue to write roughly a quarter of a billion dollar check each year to PARA? That's a decision that has to be made to solve the problem that was created back in the okay, year 2000. Okay, but you support that? I do. Okay. Brian? We have to solve the problem, but that answer is not always throwing money about at everything and having government continue to grow. And so I think it's a structural issue that we have to address with PARA first. If you go to my website, brianwatson.vote, you'll see several recommendations that I have of how to fix PARA, which doesn't always include sending a quarter of a billion dollars to PARA every year. Okay. We have 60 seconds left. I'm going to give you each 30 seconds final. Final comment on PARA. If you did one thing to improve PARA, Dave, what would it be? Uh, I'm concerned about uh, making sure that our retirees going forward have a COLA that keeps them sustainable. A cost uh, of living increase. Cost of adjustment. living in, uh, adjustment. And that our balance is uh, maintained here, that we in fact have benefits that go out that uh, don't exceed the money coming in. So we're going to have to go back and take the big picture look at this and make sure that we have a good effective system that actually allows uh, the state of Colorado to deliver services that we know people in the state of Colorado want. When you say money coming in, you're talking about money from what sources? So you have employer contributions, employee contributions, and your portfolio return on investments. All right, Brian. Stop making PARA a hyper-partisan issue and a political punching bag. Realize that it's a people issue, and we need to have the spine to address the structural issues right now. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. Stay tuned for part two, of course. Thanks for watching. Do stay tuned for part two with Brian Watson and Dave Young running for Colorado State Treasurer. I'm Aaron Harbor. Thanks for watching.
please contact us. We want to hear from you. And thanks for watching.